Hello and welcome back to another week of Weather or Not Podcast. I'm your host, meteorologist Scott Sumner. Recently, I spoke with Michael Mann, geophysicist from Yale University. Michael's research interests include the study of Earth's climate system and science, impacts and policy implications of human-caused climate change. He's been lead author on the Observed Climate Variability and Change chapter of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is IPCC, and has multiple honors and awards to his name, including being selected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 2020. So without further delay, here is my interview with Michael Mann. I'm here today with Michael Mann. He's got his master's degree in physics and a Ph.D. in geology and geophysics from Yale University. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for taking a few minutes of your time. You are on a book tour, is that correct? Yeah, it's great to be with you. Uh, yep, we're uh, touring around and talking about the, our latest work here, uh, Our Fragile Moment. Absolutely. Matter of fact, I do have a copy of that book. You want to hold that up for us? And there is the book, Our Fragile Moment, the latest one of many. Michael, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your background, please? Uh, sure. You know, I started out uh, uh, early on in life. I loved math. I loved science. Um, went off to college at uh, UC Berkeley to study physics and applied math. Followed that up by going to graduate school at Yale University uh, to study physics, theoretical physics. And about halfway through my degree, I realized that I just wasn't passionate about the problems I was being given to work on. And so I literally opened up the catalog uh, at Yale University and started leafing through to see what other research was going on on campus. And I saw that there was a professor, Barry Saltzman, in the Department of Geology and Geophysics, who was using math and physics to model Earth's climate system. It sounded like a fascinating problem. One thing led to another. The rest is history. I decided to do my PhD in that department on um, climate modeling and, and have gone on to study climate now. Interesting. It's taken off. You've written a lot of books. Um, can you please explain for those who do not know, what is the difference between weather and climate? Yeah, well, uh, it's, there's a quote, it may be apocryphal, but it's attributed to Mark Twain. Um, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. <laughs> I like that. That's good. Yeah. If you want a more formal uh, sort of definition, uh, climate is the statistics of the weather. It's the averages. It's the sort of uh, the probabilities. The it's it's sort of um, the overall tendency. How does how do weather patterns change over time? How do they change seasonally? That's really climate. How do they change from year to year because of things like the El Nino phenomenon, and we currently have an El Nino yeah. that's emerging. Mm -hmm. And of course, human-caused climate change. How is climate changing over time because of the continued burning of fossil fuels? Exactly. Now, as I said, you've just uh, written many books. Uh, going back to 2008, you wrote uh, Dire Predictions. Then in 2014, you had The Hockey Stick and The Climate Wars. That caught my eye. Uh, the New Climate War, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet in 2021, more recently, and now, of course, your latest, Our Fragile Moment. What was the impetus to write each book? And since dire predictions had some focus on how to solve global warming, please differentiate between global warming and climate change. Yeah, so, you know, uh, you're always looking for a new project, something that's new, something that's novel, that's what keeps things interesting. So my very first textbook, Dire Predictions, was really a, a pretty straight up, um, you know, um, a textbook really, but with lots of diagrams and pictures that was developed for a, uh, a first year seminar that uh, I was teaching. Uh, so uh, it was really about, um, you know, the basic science, uh, the physical science of climate change, uh, the impacts of climate change, and as you alluded to, the solutions. It sort of mirrors the the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. C -C, yeah. But it, the idea was to sort of break it down so that ordinary people, uh, you know, can can really uh, understand it. Because it is technical. I mean, everything, I was reading your book, and, you know, I'm not a, a dummy, but I'm not, you know, the most brilliant man on the planet either. And some of that was kind of interesting. I had to reread a couple of times, especially, uh, you know, some of the, the history behind sure. uh, your research. But, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's so, you know, every book uh, is different. Uh, the Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars was sort of about my experience in the center of the climate change debate because of the, the hockey stick curve that we published uh, back in the late 1990s. 
Um, then sort of the new climate war was really about the challenges we face now, given that it's almost impossible to deny climate change is happening because we just see it play out um, in such a profound way. But that doesn't mean that you know, the fossil fuel industry has given up. They've used other tactics to sort of keep us addicted to fossil fuels. But what I hadn't done was to write a book for a popular audience that really tries to distill the science, you know, the very science that I've been involved in uh, for decades now of paleoclimate. How did the climate change in the past and what lessons does that offer for us today? That was the purpose of our fragile moment. Right, because we have to learn from history in every aspect of it. You know, if you don't learn from history, we're foolish, you know, because things do are cyclical and things come around again. Um, you know, reading your latest, uh, you go in depth and you give a great breakdown of geological time. And I was wondering, do natural variations in climate contribute to today's climate change based on changes in the sun and volcanic activity? Yeah, so uh, we always have these natural factors in the background. And some of the important climate changes that predate the industrial era um, are related to those factors. Uh, the Little Ice Age mm -hmm. was a period that was relatively cold, especially in places like Europe. It turns out that that has to do with the details of how the climate responds to these natural drivers. And so they're still there in the background, but they are now overwhelmed by the human driver, the increase in carbon pollution from fossil fuel burning. And so our impact on the climate is now dwarfing those natural Control. impacts. Right. Impacts, exactly. Um, you also have a section uh, referencing uh, Gia and Moody. Uh, Mudea, 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 yeah. Mudea. Uh, and within, within that section you mentioned two events that speak of the clarity to the dueling narratives of resilience and fragility. Yeah. Please dive into both of those if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, thanks. So um, the uh, Gaia hypothesis, uh, which was originally f put forward by the iconic plastic uh, scientist James Lovelock and the famous scientist uh, um, Lynn Margulis. Uh, the idea, um, and they first put this forward in the early 1970s, is that the Earth system behaves uh, almost as if it's a living organism in the sense that there are mechanisms of homeostasis. The Earth system itself tends to keep temperatures within ba the livable bounds for life. And it almost sounds like you're, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of um, uh, assigning sentience uh, to uh, the planet, but that's, it's simply a result of the laws of physics and chemistry and biology. For example, uh, the sun was only 30% as bright as it is today four billion years ago, and if you do the calculations, the Earth should have been a frozen planet, but we know that oceans were teeming with microbes and with liquid water, and so this uh, paradox was first proposed and, and, and solved by the great scientist Carl Sagan. He recognized that there had to have been a, a, a higher greenhouse effect back then. And remarkably, what happened over time as the sun gradually grew brighter, the greenhouse effect has slowly come down in such a way that temperatures remain within livable bounds for life. That's the, that's the stability, that's the resilience that exists in the climate system. There are mechanisms that sort of balance out and keep temperatures in that range. I'm so glad you brought up the sun about 30 percent you know less bright than it is today. How, how does that come about? What, what are the formulations and who even even thought, because I, I know from my perspective yeah. and I'm sure a lot of people think the way I do that the sun's the sun. It's right. been as bright as it's been bright since its formation. Yeah. So I wonder what the concept was. Who even what? Well, you know, the sun isn't that bright. Let, let's figure out a formulation for that. Yeah. You know, it was a, a strong. Uh, you know, a, a astrophysicists who mm -hmm. study, for example, sun-like stars. So what we can, you know, the sun is just a star. That's like right. There's other yeah. stars mm -hmm. that we see in space, and um, and we can study other stars that are in the same family as our own star, the okay. sun, and we now understand sort of the mechanics by which uh, these, star, these stars sort of are born and then grow over time. It has to do with fusion of hydrogen. That's the, sort of the engine that powers the, the, these stars. And so the physics sort of dictates 
that it starts out less bright and, and then it follows this trajectory. It gets brighter and brighter. Eventually, the sun will become a, uh, I believe, a, um, a red giant. Um, it'll expand, uh, it, the corona will expand past the planets and the solar system will, in essence, be uh, vaporized. Uh, the good news is that that won't happen for billions of years. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. So we're not going to be around for that. <laughs> we will not be around for that. Don't, and, and maybe, want to. maybe we will have by then figured out how to find other habitable planets, but in the meantime, we're not going to do that. We've got to take care of the planet that we've got. That we have, exactly. Um, under the chapter titled Hot House Earth, there is a section where you talk about climate sensitivity. What is climate sensitive, sensitivity? Yeah, it sounds like the technical term, but it's really a pretty basic uh, measure. It's how much warming do you get? How much does the planet warm up when you double the concentration of carbon pollution in the atmosphere? It turns out it's a basic metric that we use in, uh, in climate and in climate modeling. Uh, and it's impacted by a whole bunch of things because you, know, you increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's a greenhouse gas, it causes warming but that warming causes other changes. It melts the ice, which means that the planet becomes less reflective. It absorbs more of the sunlight. We call that a positive feedback because it adds to the warming. And so climate sensitivity sort of is a measure of when you add all those feedbacks, what's the net effect when you increase the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere? Okay, very good. Uh, and speaking of CO2, uh, we hear about CO2 uh, levels rising globally, and current CO2 levels, and I checked this, are at 418 uh, parts per million globally. Is there a range for carbon uh, CO2 globally? Is there a range? Yeah, uh, does it vary around the, the planet on a given... Y yeah, yeah. And so it never gets below X number and it never gets above next number. Yeah, when it's, if you look, uh, we call it the Keeling curve. Um, uh, Charles Keeling uh, first began measuring CO2 levels um, in a tower at Mauna, Mauna Loa, um, the top of that volcano uh, in Hawaii, yeah. mm -hmm. um, because you're up there in the pristine atmosphere and you can get a really good measurement of the concentration of carbon dioxide. And what he saw initially was a wiggle with the seasons. We call it the breathing of the biosphere. Um, as land plants emerge in the spring and photosynthesize, uh, they are taking in CO2 and they're, and they're producing oxygen. And so that leads to this sort of oscillation with the seasons. But over time, what Keeling and everybody else saw was that, yeah, there's that oscillation, but there's something else that's happening. Each peak is higher than the last one. And indeed, we could see that we were steadily increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide. Could that be because there are more people on Earth? That's, is, is that the reason as opposed to plants and stuff which have absorbed that? Yeah, so there are uh, what we call fingerprints that we can look for to figure out where is it coming from. It's sort of a whodunit uh, okay. problem. <laughs> and if it were a natural release of, of carbon, it would have sort of one fingerprint in terms of the relative abundance of different isotopes of carbon. There are different isotopes of carbon, and so CO2 can be made up of different carbon isotopes. And it turns out that if the carbon, if the source of the carbon is, is fossil carbon, is fossil fuels that are being burned, then uh, we would expect to see one sort of signature, one fingerprint. If it were a natural release, we'd expect a different fingerprint. And guess what? Fossil fuel uh, burning gets convicted. The, the fingerprint clearly matches. Okay. Um, last question here, Michael. Why should folks be concerned about a degree or two change in the average global temperature? Because we always hear about the average global temperature. Yeah. Why should we be concerned about that? Well, you know, we're concerned if, you know, our children, if their average temperature goes up a few degrees, it's the difference between being healthy and, and having a high fever. And so this is sort of the earth having a high fever. And the consequences of that are melting ice, rising sea level, devastating extreme weather events that we're now seeing summer after summer here in the United States, here around the world. So even a relatively modest degree of warming is having those profound impacts already, just like a modest warming of our body leads to uh, a dangerous fever. There's, there's an analogy, it's a planetary fever.
Well, that was my interview with Michael Mann, and I want to thank him for stopping in at our station during his book tour and taking a few minutes of his time to explain a little about climate change, which is a very talked about topic. Well, that's all for this week's Weather or Not podcast. As always, God bless, be well, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.